My name is Tamit Hasib Khan. I'm a student of Global Health, and I'm a concerned citizen of the world. The world is a fascinating playground, and like the playgrounds from our childhood, we associate good and bad memories to them. To most people, the thought of a playground incites thoughts of innocent childhood fun and ecstasy. Even though there are experiences where you've had a bruised knee or the older kids not letting you play, it is a jollier impression that is generally left in our minds. Now, I choose to view life on the basis of that analogy because of the series of events that have happened in my life. So today, I will share with you a story of how this boy became this boy. And is standing in front of you right now with your curiosity heightened. Now, like a lot of students from this institution, our great institution, University of Toronto, I was struggling with my academics. I was majoring in global health and was looking for redemption. Now, it presented itself as an opportunity with an internship with UNICEF in Nepal. I was to work in monitoring maternal health, drawing up a statistical analysis, and then completing with the report. I was ready to live my dream. But all of it kind of felt too good to be true. My work was to commence in the beginning of July, and it was also nearing Eid in Bangladesh, and around the world, of course. So my mother asked me to come visit Bangladesh for a few days. Now, Eid in Bangladesh is taken very seriously. So I decided to celebrate our holiday on steroids with the family. So I decided to stay in Bangladesh for a few days before I fly back to Kathmandu. I landed in the morning of 1st of July, 2016, and my parents picked me up from the airport and took me home. My extended family came over for iftar that night because, one, I was back in the country, and two, people in Bangladesh love to celebrate, and we wanted to celebrate my newfound opportunity. Now, at the time, I was with this girl, Maliha, and we've been together for a while. We were together for a while. Um, during the evening, with the help of my cousins, I was able to sneak out of home, keeping in mind that I only had a few days in Bangladesh and I had to make the best of it. It also happened that our friend Tasmia was meeting Maliha that night. Excited to meet them, I went over and they told me to wait at a restaurant which was near Tasmia's place and it was called the Holy Artisan Bakery. If you look at the place, it had two establishments, the O Kitchen restaurant and the Holy Artisan Bakery. Now, when I initially went there, my friends were on their way, so I was seated on the patio. Once they came in, we were seated at the gazebo, which was by the front lawn. But there was an eerie feeling that night like something was ominous, something bad was going to happen, but I didn't fully realize what it was. We heard noises in the background, but laughed it away, thinking that it was fireworks. But the fireworks turned out to be all too real. With the deafening noises, a group of men, armed to their teeth, stormed into the property making chants that you would never want to hear. The next 20 minutes were massacre. During, the, during that period and over the night, 24 innocent people lost their lives. The restaurant itself was located in the diplomatic region of Dhaka City. And as you can imagine, the attack was targeted towards foreigners. Among them were 17 foreign nationals and two individuals from the police force. Now, I've spent days trying to think of a way 
to commemorate these individuals and their families' loss. All I can do today is leave with you these words. And it's that for those of us who were there that night, your loved ones have remained with us through our experiences and our deeply held emotions. Now, I was to meet a very similar end that night. It could have been me. While we were huddled up under the gazebo, one of the attackers came towards us with his machine gun pointed and asked us if we were Muslims. The two of us pleaded for our lives and said that we were. Our lives were spared at that point, and he moved on. Now, in a situation like that, there's so much frenzy around you that you struggle to collect your thoughts. You struggle, and strategies start crossing your mind. What's the best escape route? Should I dart through the middle of the field? There's a fence behind me, but it has barbed wire on top of it. Maybe I can climb and escape. Maybe? Barely. But can my friends? Did I just escape death, or is there more to come? Now, after the frenzy died down, the attacker came to us again and ordered us to follow him inside. We followed him inside, and amidst all the chaos, we entered the building, and in a, in a table, there was a group of people with their heads down. We were asked to join them. The eight of us there became the hostages of the night. We as people have a tendency to associate ourselves to groups. Once in the group, we find identity within these groups. If you find yourself in a group like that, you start forming unworded connections. Now, the eight of us there became a sort of kin group who were strangely connected by experiences that we seldom want to relive. At a night like that, hope was like a flickering light which followed the course of events. Our survival was highly dependent on a group of individuals, a group of young men whose motives were unknown, at least till then. The point was not to lose hope. The point was not to lose hope. The point was not to do anything outright absurd. It was a situation that we had never imagined in our wildest dreams. But at the table, I sort of became a nuisance because I couldn't stop bleeding, reasoning, or begging. I had to do what I had to do. Now, over the night, they had taken our phones and were trying to make contact with some unknown parties. What they also did was they asked the waiters and chefs who were alive to serve everyone food and water, so they did. As you can imagine, in a situation like that, you wouldn't have the appetite to eat. But I ate, because maybe that was my last meal. What they also did was ask those waiters to bring gas cylinders, big gas cylinders, from the storage room and the kitchen and place them at the entrances of the building. This was insurance that the, tech, the police forces, who were by this time stationed outside, would not fire their way, fire their way in. Now, the attackers were gathered up mainly on the second floor, with at least one of them guarding us. When they were there individually, we could talk to them. I tried to know what their ideologies were. Why were they doing what they were doing? As dawn came, anxiety started to rise. But what followed was also the turning point of the night. Now, while we had our heads down, one of the attackers came and called me and another hostage from the table and took us to the second floor. Once at the second floor, 
He takes out a gun, makes a clock sound, pulls the trigger, and shows me that it's empty. He then puts the gun in front of me and asks me to take it. This is where I have my first breakdown. I'm almost sobbing, and I refuse. But how long can you refuse when there is someone in front of you with a machine gun around their necks? So I give in. I take it. He then goes on to the other hostage, tells him to open a door at the end of the corridor, which was a door to the roof, and asks him to step out. He does. Then he comes to me, tells me to hold the gun properly, and asks me to step out. Then the attacker himself steps out after a few seconds. He then orders us to go and check each corner of the roof, all the while following us. Now, what I realize now, that we were basically assurance that the snipers around us would not shoot us. My investigative skills have led me to conclude that a person who's holding a gun fits their profile, has a beard. If that person's not shot, none of the attackers would be shot. So that's when they step outside. A similar, a similar scene such as that is from my favorite movie, Batman, The Dark Knight, from, by Christopher Nolan from 2008. Now, from the movie, there is a very interesting scene where Joker, Batman's arch nemesis, has taken a group of doctors hostage. What he has done is tied guns to their hands using tape, put Joker masks on them, making them look like perpetrators. Of course, Batman, being the greatest detective in the world, figures that out and saves the day. But the striking similarity is that here, they're being used as a human shield, and once again, as an insurance. Now, this whole roof fiasco is a turning point of the night for a reason. After scouring the roof, the attacker seemed to take a breather, and in a very calm manner, he asks us, What can we do now? I knew that if there was a chance to reason, this was it. So we start having a conversation, uh, which, after a point, I ask him a question. And it's that, what's your mission? And to this, he replies that it was obvious that the attack was targeted towards foreigners because they were bringing their culture into our land. OK? So I ask him another question. And it was that whether they were ready for a hostage situation. To this, in a disappointing manner, he replies that they weren't. Now, I had to say what I had to say and what I wanted to say all night. And this was it. You're not going to kill us. Neither are you planning to get out of here alive. The police won't come in until you let us go, until there are hostages inside. So how about you let us go? and you get what you want. Which at this point, the other hostage who was with me said that even if you don't let us go, at least let the women and children go. But in my mind, I'm like, I want to live as well. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation progressed, and as usual, I got a bit too hopeful. And I asked him, so can I go downstairs and tell my friends that you're going to let us go? At which point, he scolds me and tells me that he didn't say anything like that. We go downstairs. While the rest of the group is relieved to see us, we know that not much progress has been made. So we go back to our head down position. About an hour later, we start hearing sounds, zips and clicks. The attackers come and ask us to stand up, and we do. We see that they're geared up for war. 
but much more calm than they were last night. We're confused as to what's going to happen. They bring us a tray full of phones and tell us to take each of our phones, and we do. Then they show us the exit and tell us that we can leave. We're free to go. Now, I don't know about you, but my intuition tells me that our little conversation upstairs worked. Yes, we were photographed there for the world to scrutinize. But to me, that conversation was also the turning point of the night. What I also learned from this is that half-truths, half-truths propagated by the people and the media alike can destroy people's lives. Very few people, other than the authorities, took what we had to say before making a verdict. Now, I'm saying all of this because I've never had my experiences shared, whereas a lot of people have had their opinions read out aloud, and in turn have had a lot of people's lives jeopardized. What followed is a story of its own. Um, I went through police custody, remand, jail, and a very long and lengthy court battle. But following the night of horrors and during the ordeal, this was given to me by a very special person. He gave me a lot of hope when there wasn't any. And on that note, this is what we call a gamcha in Bangladesh. It's a genius invention because it serves as a headwear, a sitting mat, a handkerchief, a towel, and many other functions, including it being a pretty cool fashion accessory. <laughs> this is supposed to remind me of a time which is supposed to leave a scar in a person's life. But to me, it highlights a positive instance. It's a bright speck of a moment which I choose to hold on to. This gamcha was not an ending, but a beginning. My beginning, my new beginning, started with me coming back to U of T as an undergrad. I'm back to chilling a lot. <laughs> my parents absolutely love this word, chilling, but <laughs> can't figure out why we have to chill so much. <laughs> and on that note, my parents, who've probably been affected the most by all of this and have given it their most to get their baby boy back to safety. My brother, us doing the 20-year challenge. <laughs> this man has moved mountains to get me here safely to Toronto. This is the three of us, me, Tasmia, and Maliha, many months after all of that mayhem. I miss you guys. My amazing friends who've given TV interviews for me, because they have my back. To all of you, for not giving up hope and trying. And last but not least, a movement which started off of social media without my knowledge, and then coming into fruition, and eventually doing something that was bigger than me. Thank you, all of you, to the thousands of people who have been part of this movement for believing in something that was bigger than all of us. Now, people have asked me, 
Tamid, how has all of this changed you? I tell them, I'm a lot of the same. In the ways it has changed me, should I really be worried about how it has changed me, whether it's good or bad? Do I still think that the university system is inherently flawed just because I can't get an A in a course? Has all of this changed the direction of progress in my life? Has an experience which is supposed to leave a lasting scar supposed to stop me from looking forward? Absolutely not. Now, life is about being resilient. It is whether you go through a tragedy or whether it is recovering from one. Now, going back to the playground, I believe that I can continue with life because I can look back at life like the playground, the positive instances, and not the bruises and not the tears. It's when you can have life through that positive lens and make it all fit together, you'll see that life itself falls together in a way that you could have never imagined. Thank you.